this topic certainly um, very topical. Uh, trust in U.S. government has been an all-time low uh, the last several years. The Pew Research Center has been uh, recording annually surveying Americans to what extent do we trust our government. Uh, the survey started in 1958. It was at its high point in the early 60s when as many as 77 percent of Americans polled said we trust our government most of the time, if not all the time. And probably reflective of the time, a government had gotten us through World War II, had gotten us out of the Great Depression. The US was on top of the economic world. Nowadays, only 24% of Americans say we trust government all or some of the time. Uh, it was as low as 18% uh, just in 2017. So it's ticked up a little bit, but not by much. And again, probably reflective of the time we've been through since the late 60s, the Vietnam War, Watergate, uh, scandals, uh, seemingly government outcomes that were not uh, satisfactory. And I think it explains uh, why we've seen political candidates on both sides of, the, sides of the aisle, like Trump and Sanders. The topic deals with why nations succeed or fail. Um, whether it's autocracies, which were the norm through the 1800s, to democracies, which are nowadays the norm. Economists uh, think of the world as operating uh, through markets and individuals being motivated by their interests, whether they're altruistic or pocketbook interests. And when we look at the political sphere, uh, what we think of on the, the good that's being created and sought is wealth transfers. Individuals and the interest groups they mobilize in are interested in favorable wealth transfers. The people that supply them are the people within government, whether it's the monarchs, whether it's the democratically elected leaders, whether it's the bureaucrats, uh, they're behind the supply curve. And the good that's uh, uh, the price of the producing these wealth transfers, what motivates politicians is political support whether it's direct contributions or indirect sources of political support. And usually when we think of why markets break down, uh, and this has been the norm maybe for the last 50 years since this model has emerged in the economic world, is we, we think of capture from the demand side. Um, economists notably from the University of Chicago that said, look, more than likely it'll be the producers that'll capture their more easily mobilized. And so they'll end up being the ones driving favorable legislation. And in a fascinating way, these right-wing economists were very much aligned with Karl Marx of 100 years ago, who believed it was the capitals that would capture the political process at the expense of the proletariats. As the models deepened in recent years, it's allowed for other interest groups to capture the process from the demand side, labor unions, consumer advocates, as examples emerged where it was seemingly these interest groups that held sway on a particular piece of legislation. Economic elites, one percenters. What's been largely neglected though is the supply side and to the extent that they can co-opt the system. And it's interesting because had we been analyzing politics 200 years ago when autocracies were the norm, we'd think, look, it's the supply side that's it. Uh, why? Politician, why the political sphere breaks down, it's because people within power have co-opted to their benefit. People like Louis XIV in France and the Bourbons who could say, l'état c'est moi, the state is me. I basically run the show, I own it. Whenever um, investigators look who might have committed a crime, they look for motive, means, and opportunity. People on the supply side have all three. And again, the role is much more obvious in autocracies, but they're also there, they're human beings that are on the supply side of politics in democracies. And this isn't to argue that people on the supply side can't do very noble things. They're human beings that are like the rest of us. They have interests that can sometimes advance the public interest, but they also have foibles like the rest of us. In, there was a famous uh, political scientist, Harold Laswell, who said politics was the study of who gets what, why, how, when, and where. Who 
is on the supply side. It varies whether it's an autocracy or democracy, but it's the rulers, it's the elected officials, the public employees, the military that the supply side employs. When we think of the system being co-opted from the inside, uh, you can think of a simple equation where what's there to be gained? Uh, the profit potentially depends on the potential gains how much slack, how much ability people have on the supply side to co-opt the system and their extent to which they're interested. Are they motivated to exploit that slack or not? What motivates them and what and how do they pull it off? We can certainly point to cases of kleptocracy and those are more the norms uh, of cases where governments go bad and get reported on. Uh, for example, the Marcos family and uh, to what extent they were able to co-opt the system in the Philippines. Vladimir Putin's rumored to have personal wealth of $200 billion in Russia. And Navalny recently exposed that this major palace that's being built for him um, on, the, on the Black Sea and the expense that's been employed. Uh, other examples like Trujillo, Trujillo in the Dominican Republic, whose wealth was over 100% the GDP of his, his country. Mir Osman, uh, during British rule in Indian days, his wealth was 2% of US GDP at the time. Henshin, in the case of China in 1800 BC, who still uh, reviled as one of the ultimate uh, co-opters from the inside in that country. But more important than pecuniary motives would argue that ideological motives, and these have really created the train wrecks. These also motivate individuals for ill or for good. When we think of what happened with leaders such as Hitler, such as Mao, such as Stalin, the fatalities, the suffering, ideological motives, and uh, there's a, a Friedrich Holderlin, a German romantic poet for the 18th, from the 18th century, has a famous quote where he said, what has always made the state a hell on earth has been precisely that people have tried to make it their heaven. So these ideological motives that are behind individuals and that are important to all of us. And capture from the supply side is often symbiotic with demand side interests. Uh, let me give you a case in point. The best analogy I can think of is DNA. When there's a cancer on the body politic, the DNA, the double helix, is composed of four amino acids. And these four bond together in a particular way. Cytosine uh, bonds with guanine, thymine with adenine. If one of the nucleic acids is out of whack, then the nucleic acid on the other side is also likely to be out of whack. So if there's something wrong on the demand side where the system can be co-opted, it also creates this lock-in effect on the supply side. Let me give you the first reason why we can't count on the invisible hand to ensure efficiency in political markets. And that is economic stakes do not translate into political clout. If there was a one-to-one -one translation, we wouldn't have to worry about there being a market in politics. But because of this non-one-for-one -one translation, we do have to worry. Classic case in point, sugar quotas. We shoot ourselves in the foot each year in this US by about $4.5 billion. Consumers as a group, we lose about $5 billion because we limit how much sugar can come into this country from overseas. Producers in this country gain about $500 million a year. So the net loss to the country is 4.5 billion. Why don't we get rid of these policies? Uh, well, it's because we each as a family of four average about a $50 loss a year. We have no motivation to show up in Washington to con contact our congressional rep and say, get rid of this crazy limit on how much sugar can come into this country. But producers are much more concentrated in places like Louisiana and Hawaii. They have a lot at stake. They show up in Washington to lobby their congressional representatives. Now, how this creates a symbiotic capture uh, that gets even more locked in. So when you have higher sugar prices in the US because not enough sugar can come in, people start looking to substitutes like high fructose corn syrup. Uh, 
that's produced by companies like Archer Daniels Midland, headquartered in Illinois. And keeping sugar import quotas in place are also the producers of high fructose corn syrup. They benefit because demand for their product is stoked up when we limit imports of sugar. So you'll often see the Senator for Hawaii lobbying or voting with the Senator from Illinois to keep these sugar imports in place. And there's a very famous uh, quote by Milton Friedman, there's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program. These quotas have been in place for decades, even though year over year we're losing $4.5 billion. There are plenty of examples where capture from the inside has occurred. The Ming Dynasty, for example, in China. If you look back at 1500, China and the Ottoman Empire were on top of the world. You would have predicted that nowadays they would be holding sway. They would be the dominant influences. They basically shot themselves in the foot. The Ming Dynasty in China, canal systems, gunpowder, monetary systems. They were much more populous, much wealthier than Europe but they went through several rulers, bad emperors, uh, that essentially started to look unkindly at trade at not allowing merchant ships to be built. The treasure fleet uh, was uh, that had been the pride of the uh, Chinese, the Ming dynasty uh, was uh, laid up on dry docks. You couldn't build a ship beyond a certain size. Uh, populations were moved inland. It became a very anti-trade oriented culture. Similar thing with the Ottoman Empire, it shot themselves in the foot. From being on top of the world, uh, they became the sick person of Europe. And a lot of that, uh, when you looked, they banned printing for close to 250 years. Uh, starting around um, 1578, uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Sultan, uh, for a variety of reasons, fear of uprisings, but also because of all the public scribes on the payroll uh, threatened to lose their jobs if you allowed uh, easier ways to print products. And then also a lock-in uh, from, and sometimes this also shows how institutions and their usefulness can change in a society. What made the Ottoman Empire strong was something called the emissaries. It was the fierce fighting force that allowed the empire to grow. They essentially conscripted young men uh, from territories they would raid, uh, largely Christian young men, who were then sent back, um, kidnapped, and sent back to Constantinople, trained in the regime. You weren't allowed, you were a one generation servant of the regime. Your sons couldn't become Yanissaries. But they, over time, acquired a lot of power. They were the fist uh, for the Sultan. And slowly the rules began to change as they acquired more influence. Now your sons could, uh, could become a Yanissary if your father was a Yanissary. They became such a force that limited change uh, that two sultans that tried to limit their power were murdered by the Yanissaries. They contributed to the sickness uh, that ended up uh, limiting the growth of the Ottoman Empire. In 1800, the Ottoman Empire had a literacy rate of 2 to 3% versus places in Western Europe, like Germany and England, that was 50%. Venetian Republic is another great example where they, Venice sat on a crucial crossroads. The old wealth relied on the new wealth to conduct trade with China, with places on the Silk Road. But the new wealth began to acquire political power. Late 1200s, there was a famous Serrata decree a closing to the new wealth of the political power in Venice. And to that Serrata legislation, modern political scientists attribute to Venice declining as an empire, that now it makes its living largely on being a tourist destination, but nowhere near the hub of economic vitality it used to be. They're modern examples. We read about in the paper all the time, North Korea, Russia, Iran, Venezuela. Venezuela used to be a democracy under Chavez and Maduro. Uh, it's turned into an autocracy. India, the largest uh, democracy in the world. Uh, recent elections in 2014, one study documented that uh, a third of the elected politicians were under criminal indictment. Argentina was on top of the world, had an economic welfare, wealth level rivaling the United States in the 1920s has become a basket case, largely because of co-opting 
from inside. And even the world's largest autocracy nowadays, as well as the democracies, has to worry about these issues. Under President Xi in China, whether we look at what's happening with the Uyghurs or in Hong Kong nowadays, of the 1,200 wealthiest Chinese, a seventh of them are in the political party. So it's gonna be very hard for them to give up power. In the US, um, would argue this is something we have to worry about too. Uh, for example, um, when you look at senators and congressional reps, a study done over 1985 to 2001, the average senator over that period, their personal stock portfolio outperformed the market by 12.3% a year. Congressional reps and Republican Democrat, their portfolios outperformed the market 6.3%. So either we've been electing incredibly wise people to go to Washington, or it helps to be inside government. Now, this is what motivated our former congressional representative, Louis Slaughter, to pass the Stock Act, the Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge. But people are still finding ways to get around that. If we look at the recent, for example, senator from Georgia and the inside knowledge she and her husband both benefited from, or Chris Collins, who went to prison uh, right next door from Buffalo and the inside information his family was benefiting from. Public sector unions, while private sector unions have been declining, public sector unions are on the rise in the United States. They've had flip-flop relationships. Private sector has gone from 37% unionized to 6%. It's been the mirror opposite for public sector. And this matters in spheres like education, it matters in fear in spheres like law enforcement. Would argue, for example, that a key reason why we have issues with police accountability is it's really hard to fire nowadays a misperforming police officer. Uh, I'm with a private university. I would hope that somebody with 17 or 24, depending on whose accounts you read, instances of malfeasance such as Derek Chauvin, the officer in the George Floyd case, would no longer be with our organization. It is really hard uh, nowadays applied immunity, implied immunity to get rid of a police officer. The same is true of our educators. Uh, if you've watched, for example, the movie Waiting for Superman, it is really hard to, to fire a, 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 a public school teacher that is not performing well. And it's something we're gonna have to come to terms with. Uh, Raj Shetty, uh, who's a leading economist at uh, Harvard University, has recently done a study, your generation that's now in high school, if you could fire the 10 worst performing public school teachers and replace them with mid middle level strength teachers, the impact over life, lifetime earnings would improve by $117 trillion. Our current GDP in the US is 20 trillion. So a huge impact if we could reward better productivity in the public sphere. So, but that's something we'll argue would have to come to terms with. And then the last uh, reason we'll give why political markets break down. Power is the currency of the realm in politics. You get to produce the wealth transfers because you have the political power you get to capture the system because you have access to that power. It is really dicey to be bought out and to be able to still preserve those gains or your life. In the corporate world, if you're screwing up, people can buy shares in your company, give you a golden parachute and you're gone. And then the company and its stockholders can try a new strategy. Buyouts are very hard in politics. For example, in North Korea, uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, you can't, it's hard to import goods from overseas. Uh, he was a student in Switzerland. Uh, he still loves apparently Emmentaler cheese. He's one of the world's largest buyers of Emmentaler cheese. It's hard to imagine that there's a buyout big enough to say, look, Kim Jong-un will pay you, go to this island, let your country prosper. Uh, because he'd probably be afraid of all the people whose lives he's ruined hunting him down and either killing him. Uh, so it, it's hard to write an ironclad contract once you get, get out of political power. You'd think if you were screwing up, 
Uh, and this is what happens. If the company's not performing well, people as consumers will go to another business. Shareholders will boot out management. In the political sphere, the exact opposite happens. And what I did is a study a few years ago comparing autocracies and democracies. And the first column uh, is just the average duration of the leaders of those countries. The second column is their average government's transparency. There's a group out of Germany called Transparency International that each year rates a country on a zero to 100 scale. Zero, you're completely untransparent, you're opaque. Um, 100, you've got a perfectly clean government. And this perverse result that in countries and autocracies that on average are less transparent or more corrupt, the rulers stay in power in order of magnitude longer. They cling to power to the detriment of their citizenry. So our founders of this country were right. Um, people aren't angels. We need to set in motion safeguards and safeguards in general work. You have cleaner forms of government, but the average democracy is still very far away from a perfect score of 100 when it comes to transparent forms of government. So we'll close with this. Democracies, uh, people that have studied this, definitely outperform autocracies, but they're far from optimal. We still have a lot of work to do, and especially incumbent on your generation, you're wearing the red slippers like Dorothy was. Integrity has been improving over time, especially in democracies. But integrity doesn't mean that we trust our government, like in the United States. We may have a cleaner form of government, but we still may not like the outcomes that, that emanate from the public sphere. And just because we have a competitive system doesn't mean we have integrity or trust. The government of Mexico, for example, turns over every six years. Italy has been a revolving door. And yet, uh, fairly, when people are surveyed about their level of trust or integrity in, in, those, in those democracies, uh, those democracies score, um, generate pretty low scores. Uh, 